This is a 2020 Dodge Charger SRT Hellcat Widebody, and it is the most insane sedan on sale. For one thing, it's an $82,000 Dodge Charger, which is insane, but it's also a 700 horsepower Dodge Charger, which is just as insane. Today, I'm going to review this car and show you the rest of the insanity. First, a little overview of the Hellcat Charger. The Charger was, of course, a popular muscle car, but it was reborn in 2006 as a full-size sedan. It was heavily updated in 2012, and that's when Chrysler really started going crazy with the power. There was the RT model with 370 horsepower. Then there was the SRT model with 470 horsepower. Then there was the SRT 392 model with 485 horsepower. And then came the Hellcat. The Hellcat came out a few years ago, and it was intended to be the top of the line performance model. Under the hood, you have a supercharged V8 that makes 707 horsepower and 650 pound-feet of torque. This car will do 0 to 60 in 3.6 seconds, and it'll hit a top speed of almost 200 miles an hour. In a vehicle whose base model is mainly known for being the default upgrade when the airport Enterprise rent-a-car runs out of Kia Optimas. But the Hellcat isn't news because it's been out for a few years now. But this car is news because it has a new look. It's called the Charger Hellcat Widebody because it has, well, a wider body. It has these giant fender flares that add three and a half inches to the overall width of the Charger, and it has some new wider tires that fit under those fender flares for better grip. Now, for the 2020 model year, the only way you can get a Charger Hellcat like this is with the wider body. And today, I'm going to show you if you should. First, I'm going to take you on a tour of the Hellcat Widebody and show you all of its interesting quirks and features. Then, I'm going to get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. All right, I'm going to start the crooks and features of the Hellcat Widebody with its most distinctive new feature, and that would be its wide body, which is made possible by these oversized fender flares that just look crazy. They add three and a half inches of total width to this car, and just look at them. I think they look really mean and angry and aggressive, and I think they're awesome. To me, they give this car an absolute boss look that the regular Hellcat just doesn't have. You see these fender flares, and you know this thing means business. Now, hiding under the flare fenders, like I mentioned before, you have wider tires. And up front, that is 305 width front tires. Now, most people don't know that much about tires, but take my word for it, these are insanely, massively, ridiculously wide, especially to put in the front of a car. Now, when you add wide fenders to the Charger, you're adding drag and hurting the aerodynamics, and you're adding weight, which actually slows this car down. The 0-60 to 60 time and the top speed of this car is lower than the regular Hellcat with no wide body. But by adding these flared fenders, you're able to get wider tires on front and rear, which means more grip when you're in corners. So theoretically, this car should handle better and feel a little better through curves than the regular Hellcat with skinnier tires. But while the wide body design is a noteworthy new feature for the Hellcat, this car also shows its ancient age in some really obvious ways. The platform for the Charger dates back to 2006, which is incredibly old by new car standards. There are some places you can tell. For example, the door handles. This is probably the last new car that uses traditional mechanical flip-up door handles, maybe except for the Mitsubishi Mirage, which is not good company because that's the cheapest new car on sale. Everybody else has gone to door handles you can grab from the top or the bottom for several reasons, including the fact that they're better with ice and easier to reach. 
but not the old school charger. And next up, another easy way you can tell this car is showing its age is with its parking brake. There is no electronic parking brake in this car. You don't even have a brake here in the center that you pull. Instead, this car has a foot mounted parking brake inside the driver's foot well. And to release it, you don't pull a little lever that will take it off. Instead, you actually have to push it down with your foot and then it pops up and comes off. Aside from pickup trucks, I suspect there aren't any other new vehicles that still have that feature. Feature. Again, not a huge deal, but something else that shows this car's age. And next up, another way you can tell this car is really starting to get old is the backup camera situation. For one thing, shift into reverse and take a look at the camera. The resolution is really not all that good. This is one of the lowest quality backup cameras you'll find. Then you come back here and you notice another backup camera issue. The basic design for this car is almost 15 years old. And when it first came out, backup cameras weren't really all that common. Dodge had to add a backup camera at some point during the production run, but there wasn't really a place in the design to add it, so they had to stick it right here in the middle of the back of the car. Most newer designs can hide it somewhere, but Dodge didn't have a spot to do that, so it's really obvious back here. Not as obvious on a dark colored car like this, but if you get a lighter car, it kind of sticks out and it doesn't really look all that good. And it's the same deal with the trunk opener back here. When this car first came out, opening up the trunk from the back of the car was kind of a luxury, so this car didn't have it. When it became time to add it later as it became more common, apparently it was too difficult to put it under the license plate like basically every other car, so Dodge just stuck it kind of on the outside of the trunk lid over on the side. You press this little button and the trunk pops open. Again, not really that nice looking, not the best place for it, not hidden at all, but that's just what they had to do to get that feature to fit with this car's aging design. And some of this car's issues are not just older design problems, but also cheapness. And the fact that in some places, it doesn't look like it should for $82,000. For example, you get into a BMW or Mercedes at that price point, and the door sill is beautiful, and it lights up, and it says the brand name or the model name. You get into this car, and the door sill doesn't say anything. Not even Dodge or Charger, something generic. It doesn't have anything printed there which doesn't really look that nice. You look up from the door sill and you can see the side of the seat, same deal, very simple, plastic, cheap, again, doesn't really look all that nice. Then you move into the driver's seat area, you can see there are some other obvious drawbacks. For example, this turn signal wiper stock is the same one I think they've been using since this car came out 14 years ago, and it just looks absolutely ancient, and it feels pretty cheap too. Another flaw for $82,000, this car doesn't include adaptive cruise control, just regular cruise control. And that means the steering wheel has these three cheap looking blank plastic switches where the adaptive cruise controls would be. Now again, if you got into a BMW or a Mercedes Benz at the $82,000 price point, all of these issues would be addressed. But you wouldn't have 707 horsepower. And that's kind of the thing with this car. You know you're not getting the nicest interior or the best quality, but you're getting a lot of bang for your buck. And so there's a trade-off there you have to weigh. And I absolutely understand why people pick this over those luxury BMWs and Mercedes, because this car has the power. And next up, moving on to a few interior quirks and features, I want to start with the front doors, which are weird because they open so wide. I'm a big fan of wide opening doors because you can get out easily, but these open so wide you can't even reach the door puller to close them, and instead you have to pull on the little storage compartment at the bottom. I've never seen car doors doors open this wide before. I'm not exaggerating. It's really noticeable, but that's what they have here. And speaking of the doors, an interesting item in the mirrors, there are two little cutouts in the side of the mirrors for lights. The upper one is a triangle. That's your blind spot monitor system, and it'll light up if there's a car in your blind spot. Pretty simple. The lower one is just a light, and when you unlock the car, that light comes on, I guess to help you locate your car in a parking lot. It's kind of an odd placement. They could have put that locator light pretty much anywhere, but I guess they chose inside the mirror itself. It's better than reverse lights like General Motors. <laughs> 
And next up, another interesting quirk inside this car. Next to the gear lever, you have a little tray, and on the tray it says Dodge Brothers, designed in Detroit. And then there's an old Dodge Brothers logo to the left. This is Dodge bringing some of its old school Detroit heritage into the modern Charger. Interestingly, while that tray does say designed in Detroit, what it doesn't say is that this car is built in Canada. I don't think that would work quite as well with the whole heritage thing. And next up, still in the center, we move on to the infotainment system, and specifically this little SRT button in the center control stack below the infotainment system. You press that button and it pulls up all the cool stuff, all the performance features that this car offers. For example, you can turn on the shift light in this car, and then when you're high in the RPMs, a light will turn on and let you know it's time to pull the paddle to upshift for the maximum acceleration performance. Next up, you can also use the SRT part of the infotainment system to turn on the launch control in this car, which is pretty cool, and you can dial up the RPMs of the launch control. So if your tires are colder, you can turn it lower, but if you think you know what you're doing, turn that launch control all the way to the top, and then let it launch. And next up, another cool feature in the SRT part of the infotainment system is line lock, which is a feature you'll want to use on the drag strip. It will lock the front brakes, but allow the rear wheels to spin, thereby creating a burnout, which warms up your tires and therefore gives you a better start on the drag strip. Not too many cars have factory line lock for better drag racing starts but this one does. And next up, another cool feature in there is something called Race Cooldown. If you activate it, it keeps your radiator fan and coolant pump running even after you shut off the engine in order to cool down the engine and the supercharger. That way they can stay cooler, which should help your next drag strip run. At the drag strip, a lot of people put ice inside their engine to cool it down. This car has a feature that'll do it with the push of a button. And next up, another cool feature inside the SRT part of the infotainment system is something Dodge calls performance pages, which has a lot of cool performance stuff. The first tab is called timers, and it times basically everything. Your one-eighth mile time, your quarter mile time, your 60 foot time, your speeds for all these things. Really, really useful on the drag strip. Basically gives you all your information before you go and pick up your time slip. That is really cool. Next up, moving down from timers, you have gauges, which of course shows you your gauges in addition to the ones you have in your gauge cluster screen, so you can monitor various car systems and make sure nothing is out of sorts. And next up, moving down from there, you have the G-meter, which of course will measure your G-forces in real time, so you can see exactly how many Gs you're pulling, which is always cool to pull up when you're driving hard with a passenger to say to them, hey, check this out. And next up, the last two tabs in performance pages will show you some important numbers. If you click on engine, this little circle comes up and it will show you real-time horsepower, torque, and various other engine data. If you go to dyno, this will also show your horsepower that you're using while you're driving along in real time in the form of like a dyno graph. So you can see exactly how much power you can peak at while you're driving down the road. And next up, another interesting item with performance pages, you can see there's a little camera icon in the upper right corner. If you have an SD card inserted into the car, you tap that camera icon and you can record. You can record laps or drag racing runs that you do so you can watch them later and look at pointers about how you could have done a little better. By the way, one other important performance item worth noting in here, if you find it too difficult to pull up the SRT screen and go into launch control to activate it, there is a button in the center control stack you can just push for launch. And when you push it, this little orange light turns on in the button to let you know you're ready to launch. But don't go thinking that Dodge lets just anyone push a button and activate launch control. No, no. There are safeguards in place to prevent irresponsibility. For example, when I did it, a little warning came on in the gauge cluster that said, I need to straighten the steering wheel. So once I submitted to that important safety procedure, then I could activate launch control and take off from a traffic light. And next up, a few other interesting infotainment features beyond all the performance stuff. One is the fact that on the main infotainment page, you can see it says SRT dashboard, but really it says dashboard 
they abbreviate it and take some letters out. The reason I find that odd is that if you go a little lower, it says vehicle user guide and vehicle user is on one line. That's way more letters than dashboard. So why did they have to abbreviate it as dashboard? <laughs> something only Chrysler will know. Next up, another unusual item in the infotainment system is that the seat controls for the driver and passenger heated and cooled seats are sort of randomly placed. They don't really correspond to the seats they control. They're kind of within all the other apps. Doesn't really make much sense, but you can move them. So if you don't like them there, you can rearrange the screen and put them where you want. You also can access these seat controls if you go into the controls tab in the infotainment system and it pulls them right up, which is relatively convenient, but I would always prefer a simple button for heated seats. Just tap it when you're cold and you get in the car rather than having to go through infotainment menus. And next up, another interesting item in here is that there is an app called Uconnect Market. This is Chrysler's Uconnect infotainment system and and the market is intended to allow you to make restaurant reservations or book a table or pay for stuff in your infotainment system. The problem, as you can see, is it doesn't appear to work. It just sits on that screen forever and ever and ever. Interestingly, when it finally admits that it doesn't work, a screen pops up that says a fatal error, which seems to me to be a bit dramatic. I don't think it really is a fatal error but that's what it tells you. Next up, another infotainment system quirk that I like is that if you go into a screen that has a scroll bar, the little scrolly part is the two Dodge slashes. This is Dodge's newest logo, and as you scroll up or down, those slashes scroll, which is a nice little piece of attention to detail. Now, next up, speaking of screens in this car, you also have a screen in between the gauges in the gauge cluster. That's a pretty standard one. You can just scroll through it and see various different car functions, tire pressures, fuel range, your speed, and a few different performance items. I'm not gonna go through this in great detail because I did in the Jeep Trackhawk and the Dodge Demon, and I'll link those videos in the description below. And next up, we move on to the back seat in the Hellcat wide body. First thing you notice back here is the back back seat is pretty roomy. I have the front seat pretty far back and I sit here, my knees don't hit the front seat. I have a lot of space to move around. This is a roomy back seat like you'd expect from a full size sedan. And next up, a couple of other notable items back here. One is that you have heated rear seats. You push these little buttons to turn them on. That's a nice feature to have, and it's also starting to become just expected for a car at this price point. Also in the vicinity of the heated seat controls, you have two USB ports, which is nice to have. You can stick in a USB and charge a device while you're driving along, which is of course good if you plan to use the Hellcat as a family car with kids in back. Other than those features, there's not really that much worth mentioning about the back seat in this car. You have three across seating, as you might expect, and there isn't even a center armrest. You can't drop this to stick your arm here. It's a pretty basic back seat. And next up, we move on to the trunk, which is pretty simply just a trunk. Nothing special in here, just a nice big trunk like you'd expect from a full-size sedan. Underneath the floor, there are a couple of noteworthy items. One is that you have a small area where you can put little stuff if you don't want it to roll around or if you don't want it to be seen when the trunk is open. Also underneath the floor, you do not have a spare tire. These wheels and tires are simply too large to include a spare in this car, so instead you just have an air compressor and some good luck from Dodge if you get a flat. And next up, we move under the hood in the Hellcat wide body to check out the engine. And this car has a huge one. Like I mentioned, supercharged V8. This is 6.2 liters, 707 horsepower. The thing I like under here is that Dodge has intentionally made this engine look cool. You have the SRT badge right in the middle, front and center, with a Hellcat logo. On the sides, it says supercharged Hemi. Both sides, you got stuff painted orange. There's no plastic cover anywhere. Dodge knows the kind of people who buy this car are going to want to show off their massive engine, and so they make it look cool when the hood is up because it's frequently going to be seen. And of course, you'd expect a huge engine like this to produce a fantastic exhaust note. And indeed, this car has one. Take a listen. And so 
those are the quirks and features of the 2020 Dodge Charger SRT Hellcat Widebody. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the Hellcat Widebody. I gotta tell you, I've been driving this thing around for a couple days and it is pretty insane. One insane part is the sound it makes when you accelerate, which is just unreal. <laughs> just so much power in this vehicle. It's crazy, crazy fast. Interestingly, when you're driving along normally, you can drive it normally if you want to. Um, and it is a fairly reasonable car, but with even a little tap of the throttle, you do hear a little supercharger whine, you hear the engine. One downside to the Charger, it's a very big car, and this still feels like a very big car. You can neutralize the size if you throw enough power at it, and they've done a good job of that. It does not feel when you're accelerating like as big of a car as it is, but um, when you're turning, it certainly does. It's not a small vehicle. The thing that really scares me about the Hellcat is the third owner. Uh, I think that the first owner is the person who kind of buys it and babies it. They, they like the rarity, the power. The second owner, they spend like 50 on it and it's still a special car for them, it's valuable. But in a few years, maybe already, the earliest ones are gonna be in the 20s and 700 horsepower for 20 some thousand dollars. That's scary. There's gonna be a lot of kids who buy these things and absolutely destroy them because you gotta know what you're doing to control 700 horsepower, even with traction control and stability control and all the modern aids. so, so fast. You know, I drive my Ford GT and it also feels really fast, but somehow this feels faster. I think part of the reason is it, it might be a little bit faster, but also it's just such a big car and moving such a big car, you just, you're like, I can't believe this boat is going these speeds. Um, there's also a sound component. This thing sounds way better than my GT. It's got a really, really incredible kick to it. It just sounds great. climbs at an unbelievable rate. When you floor it going 60, you're going a speed, I shouldn't say, faster than you can even begin to think. I mean, it's, I, I can't believe how fast this car goes, not just zero to 60, but 60 to 100, 120. It is insane how fast this thing is. So again, a stoplight kind of gives you a chance to look around the interior. Um, not the nicest interior for sure. A lot of plastic. There's leather uh, in a lot of spots too and some kind of fake carbon fiber looking thing. These seats are very nice. They feel good. They look good. They're nice to sit in, supportive. Um, but definitely not an $82,000 car's interior. This is addictive. <laughs> it's so fast. It's just really, really, really fast. I can't get over how quick you just, it's insane. And so that's the 2020 Dodge Charger SRT Hellcat Widebody. This is one of the most insane cars on the market from its driving experience to its performance numbers to frankly, its age. But even though this is one of the oldest new cars on sale, it's still a success. In fact, some of its biggest sales years have been in the last few years. And if they keep giving us crazy versions like this, it's kind of easy to understand why. Anyway, now it's time to give the Hellcat Widebody a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, I think the Charger Hellcat looks good to begin with and the wide body looks really cool with its flared fenders and it gets a 7 out of 10. Acceleration to 0-60 to 60 in 3.6 seconds which gives it an 8 out of 10. Handling is sharp given its size but still not that precise and it gets a 5 out of 10. Fun factor is high. These are immense fun to drive, especially fast in a straight line. The fact that it's a bit hard to throw around in the corners drop things slightly to a 7 out of 10. Cool factor is excellent. These are very cool, especially in the new wide body configuration and it gets a 7 
7 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 34 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories and features. The wide body has some good stuff, but also lacks some new tech, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Comfort, it's fine. I love the plush leather seats, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Quality is average. It'll be reliable, but a lot of the interior materials are pretty mediocre, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Practicality is average for a car like this, and it gets a 5 out of 10. Finally, value, and this is a bit of a tough one. In terms of performance, this car is a great value, but in terms of quality and equipment, not so much. It falls near the middle with a 6 out of 10 for a total daily score of 30 out of 50. Added up in the Doug score is 64 out of 100, which places it here against some other big engined American cars I've tested. The Hellcat widebody is great, though I personally would rather have a Trackhawk, the family SUV version of Chrysler's insane Hellcat variety of vehicles.